afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to be back here with you. I'm Ethna Trainer, and I'm your moderator for this session. Now, one thing I do have to mention before I begin, but pretend you didn't hear this, because I want you to stay here. Right now, if anybody is interested in the East Africa session, it has just started. But we're going to be talking a little bit about East Africa as well when it comes to power. So stay with us here, because I can promise you a very good dialogue, a very good discussion. And at 1545, the West Africa panel is uh, happening in, in another room. So stay with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this panel is access to power, leveraging the energy transition. And we have three key players here who are going to actually address this topic. And I'm absolutely thrilled you're joining us. Um, from Strauss Energy in Kenya, we're delighted to have with us the CEO, Tony Naga. Thank you so much, Tony, for joining us. Thank you. From Access Power, based here at one of the key players to in the Africa continent, the executive chairman, Reda El Shar. Reda, thank you so much. Pleasure. And with the Africa Finance Corporation in Nigeria, we have here the president and the CEO, Andrew Ali. So Thank wonderful you. to see you all here, and I think a very diverse group here that's going to be able to offer us the entire landscape of what's going on in power. Now, this morning we talked a lot, and even in my earlier panel, and one of the things that was mentioned was that the digitization of the economy has really been the great equalizer and the great enabler. I'm going to take a step back and maybe argue with that and say it's actually access to power is probably a greater enabler and a greater equalizer. Because without turning the power on, we can be as digital as we want, but we probably won't get too far. So Andrew, I want to just start off with you, and if we may look at a bit of a landscape in Africa, and looking at the power grid, and looking at the availability of power, probably still a few outages in power around Africa, but just give us a feel for perhaps how good or how bad it still is, because access to power on the Africa continent is certainly not created equal, is it? Not even in 2017. Not at all, and, and sadly, uh, it's still a huge problem. Uh, something like two-thirds of Africans, uh, 600 million people, actually don't have access to the grid. 600 uh, million. 600 million, yes, with an M. Um, you know, that sort of two-thirds of the population of China or something like that uh, do not have access to power. Um, those guys often pay for their energy uh, because they use kerosene and things like that. They're often paying uh, prices as high as uh, $10 a kilowatt hour uh, equivalent, uh, which when you compare that with what, you know, people pay in Western countries is 100 times higher. Um, so, so really, um, digitization has certainly helped, and particularly mobile phones, uh, to move uh, the continent forward in many ways. But really, uh, power remains a, a, a huge problem that we all need to tackle. I, I mean, a huge problem. 2017, and in one continent alone, never mind the rest of the world, but so many people without access to power. I mean, I do know when we look at the UN sustainability goals, and I know that uh, OFID, actually, the um, OPEX Fund for International Development, too, has really made that its number one goal in terms of the eradication of energy poverty, basically. And when that goes, there's, there's room for just a whole lot more. Let's just stay in Africa at the moment. Tony, I want to bring you in here. You're doing your best in one way to actually bring power to maybe not 600 million, but um, tell us what you're doing, particularly with regards the solar enablement of energy in the region. Thank you. And in Kenya. So pretty much what we do is, uh, since we have solar as a really huge resource, I don't know if you knew at the end that uh, the amount of sun we have, even right now, this moment, it can power the Earth 3,500 times. Yet, like uh, uh, I just said, that we have all these people. Since we're in Sub-Sahara, we have the most sun. Why is it that we're not tapping of it? So pretty much what we do is uh, we, anywhere where we try to innovate anywhere where a sun ray falls on, we try and generate electricity from it. So having a construction background, uh, so we in integrate solar cells into, into the pavement, into windows, into walls, 
into a roof. So basically, if you put a roof, it is also generating electricity. Uh, you don't have to put a roof in, in solar panels. The, the regional uh, roof material actually also uh, generates electricity. So basically getting it right the first time. And we make the price as cost effective. You get it for the same price of a typical traditional roof, for example. The roof was easiest to start with because uh, everybody needs a roof over their head. <laughs> and people are already used to. But again, we're looking perhaps at single family homes. Yeah. So for single family homes, um, we have smaller systems, solar home systems. Um, we have a number of companies that are doing that also in Kenya. Uh, Pico cells, where you just have a, maybe an 8 watt uh, solar module and it probably just charges uh, your phone and lights up three bulbs or radio and television. Um, so we have companies that are doing that and they make it uh, easy to access because they give a good business model whereby you just pay. For example, orig like traditionally, if somebody, if, if there's a place where solar has not actually, I mean, electricity has not reached, they would actually use uh, kerosene lamps, small kerosene lamps, yeah. and they have to keep buying these uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, about half a dollar or so. Of course. I mean, people will get access to power however they will, be it Correct. conventional fuel or, or unconventional. Yes. But I do think it's, it's something people want. Yeah. And also, I think it's, it's become really a basic human right when you look around the world. Yeah. Reda, I want to bring you in. Five years ago, you made the entry into the African market. Access Power began business there. And you have grown particularly over the years and become quite a player there at the moment. There's obviously been a big attraction for you to go there. And um, I'm sure it's not, you're not running a charity. This is a business. So give us a feel for obviously going into the market funding that market and being successful within that market? Well, a lot has been said about uh, doing business in Africa and I don't want to sound repetitive as to the challenges and, and, and the, the amazing stories that we go through and everyone goes through setting up businesses in Africa. I would want to focus on, on, on the, the lighter bits of that argument, which are basically whenever you've got a supply and demand gap, there exists a business opportunity and we've been discussing a, a huge supply gap over here so and the, this session is is nicely titled as access to power and our company is called access power <laughs> so so that's that's the that's the basic principle that we realized when we looked five years ago and said okay where should we start our business where should we set up our business and we decided to set it up in the place that needed our power the most um, and looking at uh, what Andrew was saying, 600 million people is a compelling argument. Providing electricity to 600 million people uh, is, is a business opportunity that, people sh that no one should you know, shy away from. Now, of course, what is the successful business models? How do you really provide power profitably? Because we were having a discussion as well uh, backstage about uh, how to sustainably provide profitable power for the companies that are actually engaged in power generation while at the same time making sure that the consumer gets a good price and that price is passed on through cost reflective And again, a, a fair price too, an affordable price more than anything else I think is what Africa needs. Um, what you were saying, Andrew, there is that people are paying way over the odds of the international market in terms of access to power. But continue with that, I mean, so are if you I able... Can, if I can just clarify, what I was saying was that people who don't have power and are using things like kerosene to light lamps yes. are paying okay, those okay. numbers. It's not what they're paying for power. And, and you know, the point is that they can actually pay uh, quite a lot for power and do better than, um, uh, than, than, they're, than they're doing at present. Exactly, yes. I think if you work out on a per kilowatt hour basis, for example, the rooftop solar things, they're, they're not cheap. Uh, you know, by, cheaper, by, yes. the, by the Western prices, yes. but they're a lot cheaper than, you know, buying kerosene to, to fuel your lamp. That, so that was the point right. I was making. So again, Mary, providing affordable energy, which I would think also in the African continent is probably number one. I mean, the great demand is there, but it also has to be affordable and something that people 
you know, can, it, 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 it yeah. will, of course, change their lives, ultimately. Affordability of energy is an interesting story altogether. It's a chicken and the egg problem yeah. again. Uh, because, as you know, when you go and, and set up a power plant, you, want, you, you have a counterparty, right, that yes. buys your electricity. And generally, that counterparty is a, is a sovereign-owned utility, uh, be it, uh, you know, uh, the, the transmission line operator or be it uh, a company that is set up only to buy power, a uh, captive power-buying entity. Those companies need to have solid credit worthiness yes, yes. so that whoever is investing in those comp investing to provide power to those companies is able to do that at, at, at a lower return uh, because he has a lower risk. Now, the issue is many of those companies across Africa are really bust um, and they're not credit worthy counterparties. And that's why you end up having a markup over what prices you would see in the GCC or prices that you would see in, the, in, in, in Europe. Uh, and the reason is it's just additional risk on the counterparty that ends up. And, and it's a chicken and egg kind of situation because the only way that those entities can become credit worthy and entities uh, that can procure power at sustainably low prices is for them to be profitable. And for those entities to be profitable, they need to have what is called cost reflective tariffs. So the people need to be paying what the true price of electricity is, which is not the case across many parts of Africa. And the interesting comparison to be made over here is on the telecom side. So people always say that there is a big success story of telecoms in Africa, which is absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's a ma massive success yes. story. Why is it a massive success story is, is the question. And because it was simple. The people were willing to pay the full price of the service. So why are people not willing to pay the full price of the electricity service? So there's a lot of countries that have taken the courageous step of saying, I'm going to mark up my electricity price by 25%, 50%. Zambia now has moved to, to a tariff that is 50 or 75% above what it was a year ago. And many countries should follow suit so that they are able eventually to procure and, and I do think probably partly, um, Andrew, I think people are look at the access to power and to energy, you know, probably as a, a basic human right in terms of actually being able to get on with their lives. This is part of who they are. They should be able to send their kids to school. They should be able to have uh, electric light to be able to help them study. They should be able to have hospitals that run. So perhaps, um, I, I mean, you see mobile phones all over the world and people will pay any price for them. Um, but so that, that, I, that that's a must it, it, it is funny that, that the parallel in that. But come back on this tariff issue, and we look at countries around the world that have taken tariffs, and even in this region, it, it, the tariffs, the subsidies only went a few years ago, and we look at what's going on in India, and that it's probably a bit radical to do that right across Africa right now, would you say, Andrew? It's probably, it, it, it needs to be eased in. Well, well you help? know, I, I have been working on uh, investing in infrastructure in one way or another in Africa for probably about the last 20 years. And we've been talking about getting to cost, recover, um, cost reflective yes. tariffs all the while. And, and the problem that was articulated has existed. And, and you know, that's always, the, that's always the counter argument is that, you know, you can't raise the tariffs, uh, you have to ease into them. The problem is that they're never eased into. And, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, uh, we've been talking about cost reflective tariffs and, you know, the situation, frankly, still isn't much better than it was uh, 20 years ago. And I think to some extent, um, uh, the, the sort of new models that are being brought on by things like solar uh, are changing the game, at least for the people off the grid, because, you know, they're not essentially paying regulated tariffs. Uh, but I do think that, um, again, I, you know, I, I don't like to draw too many parallels between mobile phones and, and uh, yes. power uh, because, you know, they're very different in, in yeah, many yeah. ways. But if you go back to the uh, origins of uh, mobile phones, uh, when they first launched, you were typically paying, you know, maybe $100 to get a SIM card and maybe, you know, 30 cents a minute uh, for Air time. Yeah, so it was expensive even yeah, back today, then. Yeah, today, uh, you know, they give you the SIM card for free. Sometimes they even pay you to take the SIM cards off them. Yeah. 
and you know you pay you know one cent or you know, depending on what package. Uh, and for, a few thousand dollars for your fancy phone. For, for the airtime and you know a thousand dollars for the iPhone 10 if you The cheaper if you phones want coming it. on the market and the but, access to but, smart but the phones. But yeah. the point I'm trying to make, the serious point I'm trying to make is that when they, you know, at the beginning of the network, when they were charging the high prices, that gave the capital and the cash flow to invest in the market. Then, then you know, once the market was developed, the prices came down. They couldn't have developed the mobile phone network giving away the SIM cards on day one. But because they've had the money to invest and to develop a system, now the prices can come down to, to the marginal cost, which is what you would expect in a system. So if, if you start on day one, underpricing, quote unquote, your power, you have a situation, and it's not the only cause I have to say, but you know, it's, it's one of the major causes. You have a situation like you, you do today. Because even the sort of 30% of Africans who are connected to yes. the grid, you know, that power is not exactly, you know, the highest quality. We have power cuts, we have brownouts, the, the quality isn't good, you know, it's hard to run a business even on that power. So, so and, and, you know, a lot of it is due to un, underinvestment because of, of tariffs. And I think you find that the countries where the tariffs are more cost reflective typically have better outcomes in terms of... Uh, where they are in power. Talk to me, um, Rede, about the procurement, and again, in different countries, it's probably very different. How transparent is the procurement model in terms of going there to bid, to, to get your bid in order, and um, are, are you content with what's on offer? Uh, do you feel confident in terms of putting that bid in and making sure that it is rewarded to the best party? Well, I would, that's interesting because I would say transparency in procuring your power is probably the other side of how you get uh, lower tariffs and lower, more affordable tariffs beyond just making uh, cost-reflective uh, tariffs. Because, look, transparent processes give confidence to the investors. Yes that once you're going to go and put in your, your, your bid, you're going to do your best, you're going to try to put in the best price you have, and you get the confidence that indeed you're going to be awarded on the base of the lowest price takes home the, the, the deal. Uh, now, the issue that is faced in many parts in Africa is the, the evaluation models are still not evolved enough to, to, to accommodate the transparent tendering process. And if I want to draw a parallel to a region in, in Dubai, for example, that has had a long, long standing history in procuring power on a transparent basis, tendering basis, and, and the way that it has evolved, it, the whole system has evolved in down to a single number, which is what is the price of that electricity that you're selling me? And if you're the cheapest, you, you build that plant. Now in Africa... Okay, but we, I mean, cheapest and best, surely. I well, mean, there's no point being the cheapest and not able to deliver. No, obviously, because obviously the, the process starts with a pre-qualification, so yes, yes. eventually you only get the people that are capable of delivering. So this is within a pool of capable people, so I'm not... So within that pool of capable investors, the, pr the lowest priced bid we'll takes win, yeah. it home. Now, what happens in Africa in many places is exactly what you were saying, which is they add additional subjective criteria beyond uh, what is you know, very straightforward, like you, lowest price, you go for it. And this subjective uh, criteria becomes a catch, uh, a catch both for the investor and for the procurer as well, and taints the transparency of certain processes. Um, so that's, that's the issue over there, and that's something that should be looked at. There's a lot of programs that are being rolled out across Africa, be it the IFC scaling solar, uh, be it the World Bank providing a lot of help on, on setting up those tenders and so on. But this is really a, 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 an area where people should focus on. Yeah, and, I, and if I can say, um, just to give an example uh, where it has worked very well, and actually it also brings in the previous point, is in South Africa. You know, they have something called the refit program, which is a feed-in tariff for renewable energy. Um, they started this uh, several years ago, and when they and they have a quite a transparent process uh, where people, you know, bid on 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 the sort of price that they're going to provide the the power. Uh, when they started, 
uh, you know, it was sort of a relatively okay price. But over the years, because it has worked very well, uh, because people have seen that the risks that they were afraid of initially uh, didn't materialize, the prices that you now get selling power on this program have about halved. And they've been able to bring in something like, I believe, uh, 3,000 megawatts of renewable power since the refit program started. So that's actually really a very good uh, success story uh, coming out of Africa in power, in renewables. And it shows how the costs also fall, uh, but often you know, have to start off uh, higher before they come down. So there are some innovative schemes out there and some yes. processes that are working. Um, Tony, if I may just quickly come back to you, and I, I want to continue on what you're talking about as well. But are you, your business is completely off the grid, or are you getting to a point whereby you will you know, get capacity that you can feed back into the grid, or is that just it's so we not do possible? Both. Thank you. So we do both. Mostly uh, the ones that we started, we had put them off the grid. Yes. But now, okay, part of, this was part of my research in engineering school, why we're not having all this energy access. And uh, uh, those three things that actually were, were big uh, that came out strongly, and one of them was the uh, tariff, like, so high cost of initial access, not the entire cost of ownership, but the initial access. So if you have, if you can find, because for example, we have, uh, we're putting a tea factory that is paying 60,000 US every month. So if we put up, like now we, the board is deciding on this, if they put up uh, our one megawatt solution, including storage, so generation and storage, they will only, so they'll only end up paying about 40,000. We'll, we'll cut about 20,000 immediately in addition to no power outage and, and assurance of uh, basically power assurance. Um, effectively, if they were going to pay the 60,000 for the lifetime, the 25 yes. years, they would have paid $20 million. But the project itself is 3.5 million. So 3.5 and 20 million. So you see the difference. The 3.5 is what is the hurdle to, to enter because they probably don't have it immediately in the account. But they will still end up paying way more than that 3.5. They'll pay $20 million in the, for the lifetime of this one megawatt plant that we're talking about. So if, uh, if we get financing, we're able to, we're going to lower the, immediately, they don't need to raise the 3.5. They start at 40,000. So 60,000 immediately, they start at 40,000. Within four or five years, uh, payback, but they continue paying. And this is a story we want to replicate in all these uh, uh, industries uh, across the board. So yes, we have an issue of uh, access initial entry. Um, and the second one was, was intermittency, because we know now that every country is looking at uh, adopting the COP. 21 and COP22, whereby we're looking at doing uh, 95 upwards of renewable energy. But we have an issue of, uh, of intermittency. It, well, just the hard word to say that now I could have wind, and the minute after that I may not have wind, or during the day I have sun, and at yes. night I don't have sun. Yeah. So we have also come up with a storage mechanism that actually we compress air. Instead of using batteries, we just compress normal layer. And this is part of the solution that we're integrating into what we are, uh, uh, we it's about 10 times cheaper than battery, and it does way more than what. Uh, uh, and this, it's, it's working well at the moment oh, yeah, for what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew, if I can bring you back here. When we look at the Africa Finance Corporation, obviously you're providing finance for, for projects, um, you've been in the business for a while, but you're also in development yourself, and you're working on not just major projects. Talk to us about not just the financing, in terms of some of the other projects that you're actually putting together and building sustainability really into this. That's what it's about as well. Well, um, yeah, so uh, over the 10-year life of, uh, of AFC, we've invested something like $4.5 billion into about 28 countries in Africa in various types of uh, infrastructure projects, not just in power. Um, and one of the things that we actually figured out early on is that while there's a huge need of uh, money to, or, of financing for infrastructure in Africa, and 
depending on the studies you look at, it could be up to 30 billion, 50 billion dollars per annum. Um, there are actually, you know, to, back then and today, there is actually more money chasing uh, fewer available projects that you can actually invest in, as we call them bankable projects. And that's because, you know, translating the fact that, um, you know, you need power in this country or in this city to actually having all the contracts, all the documentation, having done all the studies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and having all that in place, whereby you can actually finance a power project, is a huge gap. Yes. And uh, the, 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 the financing uh, to do this, which is very risky because, you know, you don't know that you will have a project. So it's almost like venture capital for infrastructure and the expertise to pull these things together. Because, again, you know, we, we, we haven't had power in Africa, so you don't have people who have the experience. Uh, is it, something oh, is it's coming now, but was something that was missing, you know, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and, and so AFC embarked on um, actually getting into being a, a, a project developer and a sponsor. And uh, we've uh, been a developer of a number of projects, um, most notably uh, the so-called Senpower project in Ghana, which is a 350 uh, megawatt um, combined cycle power station, uh, which we expect to come online um, early next year. And it should provide about 10% of Ghana's power. Uh, when it's online. We also, we also did this for the first commercial wind farm project in Africa, uh, which isn't the one in Kenya. It's actually in Cape Verde. It's been up and running for about uh, four or five years now. Um, and so we, 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 we've done this. We actually then realized that, uh, yes, while it's a good thing, it's hard to scale this up. And so we've been looking at how to scale, scale it up. We first did this by getting into a partnership uh, to create a project development facility uh, with another DFI called FMO from uh, the Netherlands, uh, so we could finance other developers uh, who uh, are trying to develop their own projects. And lately, uh, what we've actually tried to do, and hopefully will also close soon, is to create actually an operating African power company. So we've taken some of the investments that we have made in power deals and combine them with uh, another partner called Harith. And uh, this is going to be a company that owns uh, 1,500 megawatts of power plants, supplying 30 million Africans in six countries uh, when we close. And uh, the idea is if you have a company with a balance sheet uh, of its own, then it can really scale up the development of uh, power power projects uh, across the continent. So those are some of the things that we've been doing. I'd estimate that we have probably invested about a billion dollars in, in power in one form uh, or the other over the life of the organization. And you know it continues to be a hugely important sector for us. So the financing, some financing is there. And Reda, maybe, maybe you can both look at this, or you can all look at this if you want. So, if we see that financing is available, there is huge demand. Totally. Obviously, not enough supply. It would, if you add it together, it would make common sense that this should be a no-brainer and we shouldn't have 600 million people still waiting for power in Africa. So something is wrong. Is it to do with the, the legacy of government policy that's in place? Um, you know, it's not a popular thing for any politician to come to power and say, and I'm going to remove the subsidies. So w what's yeah. the big stumbling block? Because well, there appears to be if well, so many well, people I, have I no think, power. I think there are, there are a number of stumbling blocks. One is what we've talked about before and what you're alluding to. You know, typically, if there's a lot of demand and not so much supply, yeah. then prices go up, which helps to balance it. If the prices don't go up, then you remain with an unbalanced market. So that's what we were talking about on tariffs. Um, the other thing is, and, and hopefully uh, technology is going to, e actually technology is solving this problem. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, you have a lot of, um, you know, rural com communities that just don't have the scale to, to justify the investment. You know, if you have a community of 100 um, subsistence farmers, 
in some country that's you know 20 kilometers or 50 kilometers from the grid it may cost you know 30 40 million dollars to hook them up to the grid with the necessary transmission uh, it just isn't financially uh, viable to do that yes. and i mean if you take a country like gabon for example it's got a population of a, a one and a half million people in the size of the uk and if you take the whole of Africa, population density is actually a lot lower than Europe. So you have to invest a lot more dollars to build out a network per person than you would say in Europe, which is much more dense. Um, now, all the technology around, you know, particularly solar and off-grid solar and rooftop solar, and now that storage is also falling, I think will solve that problem, or at least help to solve that problem, because you don't have to build a grid uh, to everybody. You may still need grids for densely packed cities where it's hard to put you know, enough yes. solar on roofs to, 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 to power the buildings and for you know, industrial uses. Um, grids are also useful for you know, people who have renewable energy to put it back into the grid and sell it when they're not using all that energy. So you still need grids and they're still important. But technology is now making grids less important than they were before and opening up the market to you know, people who may, 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 may not have justified it before. So you're optimistic that we're heading in the right direction and things are good, because I'm going to have to wrap it up with this thought, and I'll take it I from both really of I really like well. to see it happening a hell of a lot quicker yes. than it is right now. But yeah, the direction is generally positive. So it's about getting the political will, getting more financing, and getting more investment. People like yourself access power. Um, what would you like to see happening that would make your life easier? Because obviously there's a huge demand to fill and you're, you're there. So um, you should be able to expand. What do you need to be able to do that? We'll need more Andros in government. <laughs> that, that'll be a good start for it. And yeah. I do have to, to wrap up. I'm going to close, give you the closing word on this one here in terms of obviously you're doing... Uh, you're fulfilling a need and you know making sure that some people get power but we have a lot of people waiting for power in Africa yeah. what needs to happen quickly so much as uh, we beat up uh, government uh, our government for example Kenya the parliament just uh, they're uh, having a tough day today I believe yeah yeah, yeah but okay. but we first <coughs> there's a there's a bill that is supposed to be passed uh, net metering basically uh, which makes it easier for for, for you, you can generate, basically you co-generate, you help each other, government and the main, um, the, the main power producers. Um, you, but for example, like we said, 600 million is a lot of people, but if we lower the hurdle such that we make it that every individual is also sub, is, becomes like a small power producer, okay. they get some little money out of it. So during the day you generate electricity for yourself and maybe extra and you send it back to the grid. And at night, um, this, you, you take whatever it is that you're getting back from the grid, like I said, if you're connected to the mm -hmm. grid. That way, um, because the net meter, the united off basically. So what you gave to the grid uh, and what you uh, took back, you net it off, so it brings the cost uh, very low. I mean, it's significantly lower than, and because that is one of the ways we're going to tackle the, the, the high. Uh, barrier to so again to I mean I think I think every initiative that's happening at the moment is a welcomed one yeah. our less than hour of power has come to an end I'm afraid so we have to wrap it up um, but thank you all um, I think we've seen out of this that there is huge opportunity there a lot of work still to be done and a lot of work to be done from uh, the political level I think and again from the uh, private business that uh, are, are I think waiting to have maybe a few more reassuring uh, signals that they should go in and actually invest in this country to make a living and have it a win-win for everybody. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, to Andrew Reda and to Tony. Thanks thank again. You. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. gentlemen.